and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center Livable Communities webinar series. Today's webinar is Fundamentals for Connecting Transit and Pedestrian Bicycle Facilities with Daniel Rodriguez and Dan Neighbors. My name is Jeremy Pinkham and I am the Communication Coordinator for PBIC and the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Before we get started with today's webinar, I want to go over a few administrative details and the functionality of the webinar software. Please note that attendees will not be able to speak during the webinar. We do expect a large number of attendees on this call, so by muting your audio, it helps us to cut down on confusion and background noise. Though you won't be able to speak, you will have the ability to ask questions. Uh, looking at this slide that shows the webinar interface, um, as an attendee, you have a control box in the upper right of your screen that collapses and expands by clicking the arrow button. Questions pertaining to the subject matter of this program may be asked at any time in the question box, but will not be addressed until the end of the program, when we have built in about 20 minutes for a discussion period. Please feel free to ask those questions as we go along, and we'll get to them after the presentation. Now we'll look at today's program outline. Before I get started, I want to give everyone a little information about what this webinar is about. This is the first of the new Livable Communities webinar series developed by the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center, the National Clearinghouse of Pedestrian and Bicycle Related Safety Information and Resources. We offer information and technical assistance to diverse audiences about health and safety, engineering, advocacy, education, enforcement, access, and mobility as it relates to pedestrians and bicyclists. The Center and today's webinar are both made possible with funding from the U.S. Department of Transportation's Federal Highway Administration. The goal of the Livable Communities webinar series is to better enable our audience to improve the quality of life in their communities by promoting safe walking and bicycling as a viable means of transportation and physical activity. The Livable Communities webinar series will be held on a bi-monthly basis. The next webinar will be The Power of 25, Advocacy Strategies for Creating Livable Communities, presented by Peter Lagerway, Senior Transportation Planner for Tool Design Group, scheduled for Thursday, November 12th. I'll provide the registration link at the end of today's program. You will also be able to access an archived recording and transcript of this program after the live webinar. It will take about a week to get it posted to the PBIC website. In addition to these webinars, PBIC also offers four different in-person training courses to provide technical assistance to professionals and community members in developing pedestrian safety action plans and improving conditions for walking. These courses can be found at walkinginfo.org slash training. If we are not able to get to your question at the end of the presentation, please do not hesitate to contact us. All of our web resources can be accessed at pedbikeinfo.org. And you may reach me at any time at webinars at hsrc.unc.edu or by calling 919-843-4859. If you do not get all of that down, this information will be posted at the end of today's webinar. Now I'm going to turn the screen over to our first presenter, Daniel Rodriguez, who will discuss the relationship of pedestrian and bicycle facilities to transit use. While he's getting set up with his slide presentation, I'll let you know a little bit about him. Dr. Daniel Rodriguez is Associate Professor in the UNC Chapel Hill Department of City and Regional Planning and is the Director of the Carolina Transportation Program. He teaches courses in transportation policy, transit planning and strategy, and urban spatial structure. Dr. Rodriguez's research focuses on the relationship between transportation and land development, some of his current research involves identifying and quantifying the personal and community benefits of locating affordable housing closer to workplaces and studying the physical activity consequences of residing in diverse urban environments for various populations. I'd like to welcome and thank Daniel for his presentation today. After he's done, we'll move straight on to the next speaker, Dan Neighbors, who will discuss practical research-based tools, and then we'll take questions all together at the end. Daniel, please take it from here. Um, good afternoon, uh, Jeremy. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dan, and uh, good afternoon to our audience. Um, I'm Daniel Rodriguez, and you see uh, the title of my talk is uh, Transit Access for Pedestrians and Bicyclists, a Review and a Look Ahead. For today's talk, I'm in the second slide, the learning objectives are, um, number one, to understand the importance of good access uh, to transit 
not only for agencies, uh, but also for individuals and for society. I want to give you a peek into the emerging evidence on this area of research and hopefully motivate you to consider uh, making access improvements to transit for pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, finally, I would like to feed uh, your desire to collect data about your interventions and your improvements so that you can evaluate the outcomes and let other ones, others, um, us, know uh, about the effectiveness of your improvements for uh, transit. Uh, slide number three, the importance of transit access for pedestrians and bicyclists um, goes beyond the ability to have additional riders. Uh, strategically, providing access to transit for uh, pedestrians and bicyclists uh, means expanding transit's reach uh, into neighborhoods. This may translate into uh, effectively giving access uh, to residents of uh, local streets or extending transit's reach to lower density areas beyond core corridors. In addition to enhancing their reach, ridership increases also produce uh, related benefits of interest to policymakers, to planners, to engineers. For example, uh, from using transit, we could reduce VMTs and related greenhouse gas emissions. We, do, we could also reduce uh, vehicle cold starts, although these are less likely to be relevant in the future. Uh, Non-motorized uh, transportation access to uh, transit could also help address the congestion hotspots that frequently afflict uh, successful activity centers. From auto-oriented suburban centers to in-city uh, transit-oriented development areas, many of these centers, when successful, have distinct local congestion problems. And uh, pedestrian and bicycle improvements in accessing transit at these nodes could help alleviate these congestion problems. At the individual level, uh, supportive access for pedestrians and bicyclists to transit means financial and health benefits. For personal benefits, a recent Brookings study suggested that uh, the working poor who drive to work spend 8.4% of their income commuting, while those who commute via other transportation modes spend less than 5.8%. This financial impact for low-income individuals is very, very tangible, and we're talking about a pretty large uh, gap between those that drive and those that take other transportation modes to work. Not only in terms of finances, but also in terms of physical activity, people who use public transportation, like subways or commuter rail or light rail, or buses, or trolley buses, for any reason, are less likely to be sedentary or obese than adults who did not use public transportation. Um, citing some statistics of a nationwide study, 29% of those who use transit were physically active for 30 minutes or more each day, only from walking, walking to and from public transit stops. Similarly, transit users took 30% more steps per day and spent 8.3 more minutes walking per day than did people who relied on cars for travel. I, I think this merits uh, a repeating once again because we're saying that 30% of those who use transit walk at least 30 minutes per day um, and only from the need to uh, getting to transit and walking from transit. The physical activity associated with uh, this transit use also has big impacts uh, on the bottom line, on finances. According to one study, of obesity-related medical costs, the extra walking related to transit use is estimated at a lifetime savings of $5,500 per person. This is in uh, $2,007. If you account for um, decreases in quality of life related to obesity or uh, disabilities such as uh, diabetes, the estimates of the savings from walking to transit are likely to be higher than that $5,500 figure. So now let me, <clears throat> excuse me, take a step back and say, uh, well, w what do we know? What do we know thus far on this relationship between the environment and transit? And unfortunately, uh, most of what we know is about aggregate characteristics of the environment, things like density, things like mixed uses, overall area connectivity. But we tend to know very little about detailed neighborhood characteristics. So starting with this uh, fifth slide, I want to summarize what we know in terms of elasticities, uh, an elasticity is uh, simply a figure that summarizes 
the percent change in an outcome, in this case, for example, transit use, given a 1% change in an input, in this case, for example, the built environment uh, characteristics. Um, and what I want to cover with this slide is the summary of density and its relationship to uh, transit use. For residential density, um, a number of studies have shown an elasticity of 0 0.07, meaning that if there's an increase of 1% in residential density, transit use increases by 0.07%. Similarly, for job density, an increase of 1% in transit, I'm sorry, in the job density, increases transit, transit use by 0.03%. So the job uh, elasticity of transit use, job density elasticity of transit use is about half of the elasticity of residential density. So overall, these are fairly small impacts, yet uh, quite important. Turning to the next slide, we cover uh, the elasticity of uh, mixing land uses. And similar elasticities are present in terms of summarizing the relationship. Uh, the figures vary between 0 0.1 and 0 0.25, depending on how uh, the mix of land uses is being measured. Again, they suggest that a 1% increase in, uh, say, retail floor area um, is related to a 0.18% increase in transit use. Or a 1% increase in job housing balance is related to a 0.25% increase in transit use. Uh, other studies have used uh, composite indices that tend to uh, me uh, measure mixed mix land uses in a single dimension, a single variable. Those are harder to interpret and tend to show a slightly lower effect between mixed land uses and transit use. But it, it just summarizes the percent change in an outcome, in this case transit use, given a 1% change in an input, in this case some built environment characteristics. So I have a table up here that uh, suggests that for residential density, um, a review of a number of studies suggests that an increase of 1% in density uh, is related to about a 0.07% increase in transit use. The effect of job density relative to residential density on transit use is a little bit less than half. 1% increase in transit uh, in job density is related to a 0.03% increase um, in transit use. In the next slide, I summarize the relationships between the mixing of land uses and transit use. I show a table that has three different measures of land use mix, the retail floor area, jobs housing balances, and composite indices, these are indexes that uh, uh, summarize in a single number the degree of land use mixing that might exist in a neighborhood or in the vicinity of a transit stop. And the evidence suggests that between the elasticity is between 0 0.1 and 0 0.25, depending on what is being measured. Again, meaning that a 1% increase in retail floor area, for example, or in job housing balance is related to 0.18% increase or 0.25% increase percent in transit use, respectively. In terms of uh, thinking about uh, distance to uh, transit stops, the elasticities uh, are uh, in the order of 0.17. Again, this means that for a decrease of 1% in distance uh, to a transit stop, uh, transit use, on average, increases 0.17%. Likewise, for street connectivity, we see a wide variation uh, ranging between an elasticity of 0.05 uh, for the percentage of intersections that are four-way and 0.27 when we look at the density of intersections, meaning the number of intersections per unit of area. So g having given you this uh, broad perspective, I, I want to turn uh, now to uh, more detailed data. So, so despite the importance of the neighborhood environment, I think it is, it is very possible and likely that street-level attributes also influence people's willingness to use transit. In other words, uh, although population or job density may matter, it is likely that the environment of streets on or of streets leading to stops may also be a support or a barrier for getting to transit. And it's this street-level environment that I label a micro-level feature 
and I'm going to use that term recurrently, a micro-level feature of the environment. And going back to the early 80s, two pioneers, Stringham and uh, Richard Unterman, who is now an emeritus professor of landscape architecture at University of Washington, identified that people were willing to walk longer distances to access transit if the streetscape was interesting and supportive of pedestrians something that many of us have noted. It's, it's just more, more pleasurable to walk in a, in, a, in a nice urban area as opposed to one that is, that is less supportive of walking. And in fact, time goes faster. And we might be wanting to walk longer distances. An explanation for why this might happen uh, emerged recently from Raymond Isaac, an architecture professor at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And Isaac suggested that the pedestrian's perception of time varies depending on the environment they're walking in. A couple of other studies, uh, Robert Cervero looked at um, access and uh, street characteristics for Metro Rail in the Montgomery County, Maryland, and he found that sidewalks and street dimensions were the strongest predictors of Metro Rail use. And Lutzenheiser also in 1997 looked at the Bay Area Rapid Transit System and identified parking as uh, one of the most important barriers uh, around transit stops. Um, BART stops particularly. And that's where he coined the idea of a sea of parking surrounded uh, transit stops as being barriers to pedestrian and bicycle access. So in this following slide, I present a conceptual framework. One, one way to think about how the microenvironment, the street level attributes, may influence people's willingness to walk or bicycle to transit is to consider upstream sources uh, to the decision to travel, things like land use, quality of transportation, or crime. Together, all these characteristics, neighborhood environment, crime, land use, the demographics of your neighborhood, the quality of transit, come together in something that I label the neighborhood environment, macro and micro. And all together, these are likely to influence people's willingness to travel by bike or pedestrian modes to transit. And we all know that a picture says a thousand words. So in the next few slides, I'm going to describe and present some pictures of what we think are some not very supportive built environments around transit stops, particularly for pedestrian and for bicycle access. So in this slide, I show a picture of a bus stop sign next to a four-lane road with a grocery shop shopping cart overturned next to it. You see no landing, you see certainly no shelter, and you see no sidewalks leading to the, to the stop. In the next slide, you even see a more desolate environment with a red circle uh, highlighting where the stop is. The stop is located next to a ditch. Again, no sidewalk, no landing. And in this case, there's road construction uh, next to the stop, um, creating a lot of mud and further limiting the access of the stop to individuals. And this third photograph um, <clears throat> shows a picture of a pedestrian at a stop standing on a concrete landing, but surrounded by a chain link fence that's about, I'd say, eight feet high. Um, not a very welcoming environment. Uh, but by contrast, uh, we tend to think about a supportive environment as this extra picture that's going to appear that has a sh shelter that is wide, it's visible, it has bollards, um, it has a wide sidewalk, it has plantings. So moving on to the next slide, um, I'm going to give you some examples of those micro-level features that I think might be important. We can categorize micro-level environmental features for transit access as those that get us to the stop and those that are stop-specific. This slide shows a list of features of getting to the stop, things like the quality of sidewalks, crosswalks, lights, wayfinding supports, trees, uh, lighting, benches, cleanliness, and uh, pedestrians and bicyclists perceived safety and security. It's likely that on only one of these features may not be enough to provide adequate access to a stop. It might require complementary measures or a suite of measures. At the stop level, we might observe a quality of the landing if it's present, 
uh, other supports for users? Do we have wayfinding aids for individuals with uh, different uh, visual abilities? Do we have benches then where people can sit and rest? Do we have enough space, uh, secure space, for uh, people in wheelchairs? What is the perceived security and safety? Are individuals inside the shelter observable uh, from the outside and vice versa? Can the, the individuals in the shelter observe those that are um, walking past by or the vehicles that are driving by? Uh, this is kind of a Jane Jacobs argument of, of being able to observe and have eyes on the street in both directions. The lighting, the cleanliness, and the compliance with uh, existing regulations is also important. In this next uh, set of slides that I have uh, taken from Urban Advantage, they visually summarize how enhancement to the pedestrian environment and the neighborhood environment can support transit access for pedestrians and bicyclists. I believe, I believe this is uh, for the city of San Jose, California. And what I show here is a scenario where you begin with a picture of a fairly normal light rail transit system flanked by three lanes of traffic on each, on each side and low density, fairly out-oriented development. And I'm going to take you through a progression of, um, of pictures and simulations that add features that we think are important, the features that I just mentioned. So in this case, I'm going to be adding sidewalks, um, some, some trees and some lighting, and a mid-street crosswalk, uh, mostly to the right-hand side of, this, of the scene. Probably that crosswalk should have had a pedestrian light. Now, if we keep uh, building our environment, if you will, I'm going to now tinker with urban development by adding residential and office um, uh, developments or buildings at fairly high densities, at what I would call urban center densities. And you will see those in the back of this picture emerging. And now I'm going to um, add some mixed land uses at transitional densities. I mean densities that are not as high as, uh, as uh, in the previous buildings, but that might have be four or five stories high, uh, probably with retail at the pedestrian, uh, at the street level. And you see those appearing closer to, closer to you. And finally, um, there are enhancements to the platform and the area on the platform. So we might have um, wider platforms. Um, we might uh, provide some planting. And you see uh, the final image. Uh, the question that I raise here from comparing uh, the two images is, uh, where would you prefer to walk to transit, the, the top environment or the bottom environment? And I think that most of us would say that the bottom environment is much more conducive to pedestrian and bicyclist access to transit. So I want to take the second half of my presentation and turn to two case studies that highlight, uh, number one, the complexities, but, but number two, also the importance of uh, conducting uh, research and examining this area of work. Um, the first case study is adapted from a talk that my co-authors and, and I gave at the Transportation Research Board meeting last year. And the focus of the study were, uh, is on the examining the environmental determinants of bicycling to rail stations in Chicago. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the Chicago Transit Authority and the Chicago Department of Transportation's bicycle program, who allowed uh, the main author of this study, Michael Schwartz, to collect the data for the paper as part of his internship in the summer of 2006. The context for this study is many of you might be aware of uh, very successful initiatives of bicycle access to transit, um, high ridership and popular among a uh, subgroup of users, but relatively understudied. And so we wanted to examine who was using it, was the supply of bicycle parking at stops uh, responsible for an increase in demand, and what were the factors that actually helped cyclists get to the stops in addition to the extra parking that was being supplied for. The context for this study is um, that the CTA, the Chicago Transit Authority, has start, started to expand bicycle parking at stations, um, all of them undercover, or most of them undercover. Most of the parking spots are in view of attendance, 
but only some of the facilities are located after the paid turnstile. This parking program is part of a much larger program, which included the installation of bike racks in all 2,000 plus buses, and the policy changes to allow bikes and trains, except during the, the main peak, area, peak hours. There are also plans to implement high capacity parking at four L stations, adding almost 380 plus spaces. So our question in the following slide was, what characteristics are associating with cycling to an L station? Is it the elements of the built environment, like bicycle lanes, or density, or mixed land uses? Or is it uh, characteristics of the neighborhood, like income? Or are we talking about uh, the influence of transit service? Like, if you have more bus feeders, do you have more or less bicycle um, commuters accessing the L? So what do we do in this case? Uh, the CTA performed counts of indoor bicycle parking at uh, the L stations during weekdays uh, from 2002 to 2006 in the summers, uh, with the exception of the year 2004. So we have four years of data. Each station was counted once per summer, and that in itself became our uh, dependent variable. We wanted to see, number one, um, how many spaces were provided and number two, how many of those spaces were being used. That allowed us to identify the demand and the percentage occupancy for each station. We used GIS tools to create a one-mile circle around each station, and then we created a number of input variables that range from demographic characteristics to roads, bicycle lanes, crime, and whether the station is a terminus or not. The increase in the supply of indoor bicycle parking was staggering. It went from around 100 spaces at uh, 21 stations in 2002 to nearly 350 spaces at 64 stations in 2006. So nearly 50% of all L stations were already covered by 2006. The use of these spaces increased at an even faster rate, going from about 50 bicycles on a given day in 2002 to more than 200 in 2006, so more than a 400% increase in the demand for bicycle parking at stations. However, I must say that the increase in use of these facilities was not even. For example, at the Orange Line stations, there was more than 80% occupancy for each year of counting. But in the Green Line station, occupancy rarely exceeded the 25%. I'll continue with the next slide of main findings. In our analysis, we found that uh, areas that had a higher percentage of African Americans and higher median incomes were less likely to have a high demand for parking facilities. And this seemed to run counter to the literature. We were expecting areas with a um, high percentage of Hispanics and African Americans to have more demand, but that was not the case. We also found that areas or stations with a higher number of bus routes tended to have a lower demand for bicycle parking, indicating that there was uh, some sort of competition where you had more buses, cycling was less attractive to get to the station. We also found that crime was a deterrent to cycle to the station. Areas with higher crime had lower utilization. Not surprisingly, we also found that the number of spaces in higher ridership at a station were associated with more, more demand. So you build the spaces, and we found that those spaces were actually filling up. Interestingly, and much to our surprise, none of the land use variables or the bicycle lane variables were significant. We thought that um, maybe it was, there was not enough variation in our data, um, but we also think that maybe the competition with transit was an interesting uh, result. I end this uh, uh, case study by showing a graph that um, contains three curves. On the x-axis, you have the number of indoor spaces provided. On the y-axis, you have the number of indoor spaces demanded, sort of supply and demand. Each curve shows the association uh, between supply and demand, um, but at different levels of other variables. So the bottom line of the three curves, the bottom curve, holds all variables at their mean values. The middle line that is a little higher holds crime at the 20% of the value in our data and bicycle lanes at its 80% value. And the highest line, the one that tells us or predicts the highest demand in ridership, 
um, holds crime at 20%, bicycle lanes at 80%, bus diversity, the number of feeder, feeder buses to the station at 20%, and ridership at 80% of all the value. The results tell us a couple of things. First, that the implementation of something like bicycle parking could be more successful if it is targeted with other initiatives such as bicycle lanes or if it is done in stations with higher ridership and lower bus feeder service. In addition, there may be a critical mass factor where adding spaces beyond a certain number may be associated with higher results than just adding a few spaces. This study also indicated that researchers may need to separate walking and cycling. Their needs can be quite different, and they probably should be looked at as different travel modes. Let me turn to the case study number two. This case study, we're examining the relationship between the built environment around transit stops and station boardings in Bogota's BRT. Some of you might have heard about the successes of bus rapid transit systems in the world, but there's very little information about how the environment around transit stops, particularly BRT, is related to BRT boardings. The context of the study was uh, the city of Bogota, where we examined 71 of 79 BRT stations. For each station we uh, traversed, we walked, three to five segments within a 250-meter circle. So we're talking about uh, five to 600 feet, 700 feet uh, around each station. And we rated the environment using a checklist. These were trained staff members. In the end, we had 338 segments with complete data. The audit that we used um, had uh, different dimensions, and I want to bring your attention to a few of those. First, of course, is we wanted to, to look at boardings. And so the BRT company in Bogota gave us information on boardings for a couple of years. But we collected information on station characteristics, like uh, whether this is a uh, uh, terminus or how many feeder uh, routes do you have, the size of the station, which we classified between one and five. We also looked at the physical attributes of the station, some of the elements that I mentioned before, sidewalk width, sidewalk quality, sidewalk continuity. Is there a buffer between the sidewalk on the street? We looked at perceived characteristics. How did our auditors perceive safety and cleanliness? And we looked at neighborhood attributes, some of the broader characteristics like income, um, unemployment, road intersections, uh, job density, residential density. Without dwelling on the results, I want to tell you how we went about this analysis. We first uh, took all that data, which is very detailed, and reduced it to four main factors that were barriers to car use, uh, what we called low safety or high insecurity, uh, connectivity, and uh, socioeconomic and built environment walking supports. But it's also possible that station boardings uh, affect how much transit supply gets provided. So in our framework, we also accounted for that reciprocal relationship between boardings or transit demand and supply. And we looked at other factors that affected transit supply, like uh, the density around the stops, the feeders to the bus system, and other modal choices. I'm going to focus our results on those four factors that were of interest to us. We found that walking supports, that lower box, is positively related to boardings, as are the barriers to car use. In other words, when you have an environment that is more supportive of walking, we actually found higher number of station boardings. Likewise, when we found barriers to car use, we also found much higher boardings at stations. One unexpected finding was that uh, we found that being less safe or with high insecurity uh, was positively related to station boardings. And we indicated this to local authorities to let them know that the concentration of people boarding the stops might be uh, an attractive scenario for uh, pickpocketing and uh, similar, uh, similar crime. What were the implications of our result? We confirmed the importance of micro-level built environment uh, for BRT use. We provided local authorities with indications of where they should concentrate their efforts in improving the built environment so as to maximize transit use, decrease greenhouse gas emissions, 
and try to help individuals uh, use transit and access it by walking and bicycling. We also showed that we went beyond the traditional elements of diversity, streets, and density. So the pedestrian supports really matter. Let me close my talk by, uh, by restating the beginning, but now at the end. The objectives, as you see in this slide, were to understand the importance of good access to transit for a variety of group agencies, individuals, uh, nonprofits, and the rest of society. I wanted to give you a peek into the evidence that's out there, motivate you to consider um, access improvements to transit, and feed your desire to evaluate those improvements when you make them. I want to acknowledge a number of individuals that uh, were helpful with parts of this presentation. Michael Schwartz um, for his work with CTA, Nicolas Estupinian and Liz Bryson for their work in Bogota, and our colleagues at the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center. Thank you, and let me pass on uh, the presentation now to um, the next panelist, Dan Neighbors. All right, uh, this is Jeremy. Thank you, Daniel, for that um, great presentation. And uh, while Dan is getting set up with his slideshow, um, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to Dan Neighbors. Um, Dan is the Senior Transportation Engineer at Vanas Hung and Bruslin Incorporated. He has over 15 years' experience in the transportation engineering field specializing in pedestrians and bicyclists. His projects have ranged from creating downtown revitalization plans to conducting pedestrian safety studies aimed at improving pedestrian facilities at specific locations. Many of his projects have focused on the transfer of knowledge into guidance for practitioners and communities, such as the development of the guides for Federal Highway Administration, the Pedestrian Road Safety Audit Guidelines and Prompt List, and the Pedestrian Safety Guidance for Communities. Mr. Neighbors has taught numerous safety courses to public officials at the state and local levels for FHWA and the National Highway Institute. Thank you and welcome to Dan. Dan, please take it. Okay, thank you, Jeremy, and thank you, Daniel, for your presentation. And good afternoon to everybody. Today I'm going to be discussing uh, the Federal Highway Administration Pedestrian Road Safety Audit or Pedestrian Road Safety uh, guidance, and specifically I'll be concentrating on the transit guide since that's the topic for today's discussion. You see on the, the next slide, slide number two, uh, it shows a basic overview of what I'll cover. Um, first I'm going to discuss the pedestrian safety guidebooks with specific emphasis on the transit guide. Uh, next I'll talk about a bus stop improvement program, which is one of the case studies that's used in, or described in that transit safety guide, and that's a case study in Montgomery County, Maryland. And the last part of the presentation will be talking about providing pedestrian access to a transit rail station, and I'll use a case study that's in Reston, Virginia for that. So the next slide shows what the three FHWA pedestrian safety guides are. The first guide is uh, the Pedestrian Road Safety Audit Guide and promptless, and that is basically geared towards uh, state and local transportation agencies and helping them address pedestrian problems. The second guide that I'm showing you is a residence guide for creating safe and walkable communities, and that's geared towards, as you might guess, residents. And then the third guide, which is going to be the focus of today's presentation, is a pedestrian safety guide for transit agencies. Together, these guides provide information to these three select groups to help tackle pedestrian problems from uh, different angles. Uh, but again, the focus that we'll be concentrating on today is the content of the transit guide. So the next slide is just an introductory slide that shows uh, a picture of a person boarding a bus stop. And um, basically, uh, what, one of the things that I want to emphasize on this is that um, the focus of the transit guide is really access to bus stops, but there are some cases where we do talk about access to rail stations, but bus stops and access to bus stops really constitutes a, a pretty significant problem because that's uh, really basically where you're having most of your issues with connecting um, pedestrians to sidewalks and crossings and things of that nature. So the next slide uh, gives you an overview of the transit guidebook, and you'll see that there's a little picture of the cover of the guide on that, on that slide also. But the main thing I want to emphasize uh, from this slide is the fact that one of the main themes is, the, is how partnerships 
are emphasized to the guide. And that's partnerships with transit agencies and uh, different state and local DOTs and with different community groups. Because really, everybody working together is one of the things that is one of the issues that where you come up with gaps in the, in the network and for pedestrians. When people don't work together and you have people working separately in a corridor, um, you know, we're not providing a continuous network. So with that said, let's go into the content of the guide on the next slide. This, this slide right here shows the five main sections of the, the guidebook. And uh, I won't read all those now, but I'll go into those in more detail. The one thing I really want to emphasize on this slide is in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see an image uh, that shows the cover of a few uh, different state and local uh, transit agency guidebooks. And what I want to really point out here is that the guidebook that we're discussing today contains case studies that illustrate how the tools that are described in each of these sections uh, apply to, uh, are applied by different transit agencies. So that's a big benefit of this guidebook, is just that kind of real-world practical information that's provided here. So the first section uh, on the next slide is describes tools for identifying pedestrian safety and access issues. And you'll see that the picture uh, on this slide shows a, a person pushing a stroller, trying to mount a, a curb to reach a landing pad for a transit stop, for a bus stop and that there's no accessible ramp to that landing pad. So that's just kind of typical of some of the problems that you, you see out there for accessing uh, transit. So the first point is bus stop assessments, and that's one of the tools that is described in uh, the guidebook. Uh, some of the tools or bus stop assessment tools, one of them are a bus stop checklist, and those are commonly used to inventory bus stops and roadway characteristics in the immediate area surrounding a stop. Uh, they're used by transit agencies, or they could be used by uh, different uh, residents, or uh, even uh, departments of transportation. There's really no limit to their use. And some of the things that are checked through these bus stop assessments are the sidewalk presence and condition, uh, the roadway crossing treatments near a, a bus stop, uh, readability of the bus stop signs, obstructions, shelter seating, and things of that nature. Now what's appearing on the screen right now is just a sam sample bus stop checklist list. And this is one that is was taken from the Easter Seals Project Action Toolkit for the assessment of bus stop accessibility and safety. And this is one of the several examples that's provided in the guide, but this is a really good example of what type of information that is collected through bus stop assessments. Another item Another type of bus stop assessment that can be conducted is what is known as a road safety audit. And there's different things or different materials that are, can help a road safety audit team uh, assess the um, uh, safety of a transit stop. And just let me give you a definition of a road safety audit for those of you who don't know. But a road safety audit is a formal safety examination of an existing or future roadway that is conducted by an independent multidisciplinary team. And that multidisciplinary team aspect means that you have, you could have uh, transit people, pedestrian experts, you could have law enforcement, you could have um, uh, highway design engineers. So you can have, uh, by having a multidisciplinary team, you're able to look at the problem from, uh, from different aspects to hopefully come at a better uh, definition of the issue, which will help have a better solution. So what you see right now, uh, appearing on the screen is a uh, table which is basically a prompt list that a road safety audit team could use to help assess the safety of a transit stop. And you'll see it contains uh, features such as the presence and design and placement of the bus stop, the quality and condition of the bus stop, lighting, visibility, traffic characteristics, and sign and, and pavement markings in the vicinity of the bus stop. Um, one more item that I want to talk about in terms of using bus stop assessments is a pedestrian or bicycle catchment area facility, facility inventory. And basically, that's something that's used by transit agencies very often to help uh, assess 
the accessibility on a wider scale of either bus stops or accessing rail transit too. And that can be, to, to conduct one of these studies, you can use GIS, aerial photography, and a lot of other measures. But I'm going to, in the second case that I discussed today, I'll kind of discuss some of those measures in more detail. There's also pedestrian observation and questionnaires that can um, be taken advantage of uh, that really help the transit agency define what the issues are and define routes that pedestrians could be taking to reach stops. Those are also important and discussed in the guide. And then the final bullet there is pedestrian crash data and analysis where the transit agency can work with the DOT and police to uh, address issues that are identified through pedestrian crashes. And one of the things that um, I want to caution people on, and this is described in the guide, is that uh, unfortunately uh, pedestrian uh, crashes aren't necessarily always documented that well. So one of the cautions is that a lot of them will go unreported. So you might have a problem where you're not seeing reported crashes. So don't, don't um, just look at pedestrian crashes as the only point for evaluating safety for pedestrians accessing transit. And then the final little uh, icon in the lower left-hand corner just, again, emphasizes the fact that there's different case studies uh, that really help describe the tools for identifying pedestrian safety and access issues. And the tool, the picture that's shown in, uh, in this uh, case study box or dialogue right now is one of a, a stop that has no landing pad. And that's just, um, that's really the, the program in Montgomery County, and I'm going to discuss that as the first case study in today's presentation. The next slide shows the policy and organizational approaches that can be taken by an agency. Uh, the first I'm going to describe is taking internal action, where you can have organizational improvements, such as establishing a pedestrian or a bus stop coordinator position within an agency to work with state and local departments and different uh, communities who identify uh, access to bus stop issues. Uh, updating policies is also another thing that can be done by an agency, a transit agency itself, to help ensure safe and adequate access for pedestrians. And some of the things that can be done to update, update policies are establishing a, a inventory of all pedestrian uh, facilities in the vicinity of bus stops, conducting pedestrian road safety audits, as I had mentioned very briefly before, and developing uh, guidelines to ensure that uh, transit stops are designed according to user needs. Uh, other actions that can be done is modifying services in terms of providing uh, better locations of bus stops, uh, making them closer to where there are uh, crossings that are being used by pedestrians, and other things of that nature. Uh, the second bullet there talk shows developing partnerships. And again, I just really want to emphasize that that is one of the main things that was discussed in this guidebook as um, a key, uh, as something that could have a, a really big benefit because what we were seeing is a lot of the problems that have, uh, where people were having problems accessing transit stops where there was not much communication between uh, the transit agency and the state and local uh, agency. So the next slide shows engineering and education enforcement. That's the third chapter of the guidebook. And um, engineering actions that are discussed in the guidebook include sidewalk and crossing designs, traffic control devices, uh, and really there's a, a lot of different treatments there that are discussed and too many to really go over in detail. But I'll just give you a little taste of some of them that are described. Uh, some of the things that are described are median islands, curb extensions, reducing curb radii, uh, implementing pedestrian signals. And these are all things that a transit agency can work with a um, local agency uh, who's responsible for the roadway to help improve uh, conditions for pedestrians that are accessing the transit stops. Other things that are discussed uh, in terms of engineering actions, our rail crossings. I did mention that uh, we, we do have discussion of how to access rail in this guide. And some of the materials in that section include uh, 
some of the most recent materials that have been published by FHWA and um, uh, FRA, the Federal Railway Administration, and also some enhanced safety features that can be used, such as active warnings at um, rail crossings and also fencing. And then finally, one of the last engineering action items that's discussed is transit stop design. The guide also discusses edu education and enforcement actions uh, because those two are important in ensuring uh, safety for all users of transit. And you can see the pictures that are shown on this slide. The one on the upper uh, right-hand corner just shows a, a stop where it has a designated waiting area or separated de designated waiting areas for pedestrians and bicyclists to ensure that uh, there's, there's not any conflicts uh, at the stop between those two modes. And then the lower right-hand corner shows a picture of a, um, a, I guess, um, a poster that was created as part of a WMATA education program. And WMATA is, sorry for using that acronym, it's just the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. And that's one of the case studies that's described in detail in the guidebook also. The next slide shows uh, the fourth and fifth chapters of the guidebook and what's discussed there. And basically, the fourth chapter is background information on pedestrian safety concepts, such as walking distances to transit, vehicle speed and safety, and pedestrian characteristics and other behavior, just so the transit agency has a better understanding of what are some of the, the issues and constraints that they have to work with. Uh, you can see the graph on the upper right-hand corner shows a graph of the um, percentage of trips to transit uh, made by walking. Uh, the y-axis will be that percentage of trips made by walking, and the x-axis is the distance to transit station in miles. And you can see the closer you are to transit, as you can guess, the more percentage of trips are made by walking. And I'll discuss this, um, this relationship a little bit more detail in the second case study. And then finally, the fifth, fifth chapter discusses legal issues, including uh, case studies and rulings, which really show that the transit agencies also have a responsibility in maintaining a safe uh, network for pedestrians. OK, the first case study that I really want to discuss is one of the case studies that's um, included in the, the guidebook that I just described. And that's um, by, it's a Montgomery County, Maryland uh, bus stop improvement program. The next slide shows a picture which really defines some of the issues that were found by Montgomery County. And the picture shows a two-lane rural roadway with a sidewalk on one side of the roadway and a bus stop on the opposite side of the roadway, which is basically placed in the shoulder. And that's like one of the main problems that they found out there. Another bus stop issue uh, you see on the, on the next slide is shows a picture of a six-lane roadway, that's three lanes in each direction, and a woman pushing a stroller on a concrete median in the middle of the roadway. And that was something, too, that was very typical in that there were just really no good paths to uh, some, of the, some of the bus stops that they had. The next slide shows another typical issue that uh, they found that was they had. And that was, the picture shows, uh, again, it's a six-lane roadway, and it shows passengers getting off a bus and crossing mid-block to get to the other side. So some of the bus stops were not placed in good locations where um, there was really no nearby uh, crossing for pedestrians. So those were kind of some of the three main issues that really uh, initiated the study. So as part of the study that Montgomery County conducted, they inventoried different types of information to get a better sense as to what were the characteristics that needed to be improved around bus stops. Now, some of the information that was collected was location, and that was a description of the location, such as area type, uh, what type of roadway, things of that nature. Uh, pedestrian access was also surveyed, and that's uh, were there nearby crossings or other connections to uh, access the bus stops. The uh, third piece of information surveyed was signage information, like what were, what were the um, signs that were used to really indicate to all users 
that uh, a bus stop was in the area. There was also safety and security of the bus stop as inventoried, as well as amenities of bus stops. The next slide shows the questions that were asked by the county to help prioritize the bus stop improvements. And these questions are, can passengers wait at the stop without being in danger? Are stops reasonably close to a safe street crossing location? Can or should the street crossing location be improved? And can passengers get to the stop along a reasonably safe path? So the next slide shows that database, which helped was developed to help answer those questions. Uh, and the picture on this um, slide basically is a screen capture of the database that was developed. And uh, on that um, screen capture, you'll see it's a map of the county with blue dots all over that map. And those blue dots represent the locations of bus stops. Now, when I advance the, to, the, to the next uh, screen capture, uh, what that illustrates is just that they took some of those, the county was took some of those different data sets or those data fields that I described to help show where they had the worst issues in terms of um, pedestrian access to bus stops. And what is appearing right now is when they queried some of those key variables, they're able to come up with bus stop locations that needed the, the improvement um, probably the most. And you can see now this the screen capture shows uh, the same map of the county, and it shows just fewer bus stops, these being the most critical. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this is the, the tool that was used to help identify the locations, but really what happened in the end of this project was that this tool, um, from the locations that were identified, it was seen that accessing the bus stops was more of a quarter issue. So when a bus stop on a quarter was issued, they looked at crashes not just at one particular bus stop, but anywhere along that corridor, because they felt that um, uh, you know that there might be people who don't use the same bus stop at any one given time, and um, that it was, it was a better approach to to solving their problems. So you can see here, as a result, uh, on on this slide, the, the next slide shows that the program progress as of January of 2008. And the, the picture on the left side just shows the bus stops that have been improved. And it really emphasizes the, the fact that the bus stops were improved on a quarter basis. You can see that there's a long string of bus stops that were improved. But some of the interesting characteristics of the program is that there was a total of 5,340 bus stops in the county. And the number of bus stops that had planned improvements was about 64% uh, or 65% of, of those uh, bus stops which is about 3,450. The number of bus stops that were, field, that were field reviewed for detailed improvements was about 629, which was almost 12% of all bus stops. And the number of bus stops requiring construction was 556, which is just shy of 11%. So I want to show a couple of slides now that really highlight some of the improvements that were made as part of this program. So this next slide shows before and after uh, condition of uh, sidewalk connections that were made. The picture shows a bus stop that basically has no landing pad and a very narrow sidewalk approaching the bus stop. Now, when I advance to the improvement, you'll see that a landing pad has been put in and the sidewalk has been widening leading up to that landing pad. So that's a pretty simple improvement that was made, but very effective. The next slide shows a bus letting out passengers on a grass median strip and the passengers having to walk down that grass median strip to reach a pedestrian crosswalk. Now the improvement you can in the, that's shown on this slide right here just shows that that, that um, landing area has been paved all the way to the pedestrian crossing to provide um, safe and accessible um, access for pedestrians. The next slide shows a person in a wheelchair that's not able to access a bus stop landing pad with a shelter. And that's because there's no curb ramp leading up to that um, bus shelter. And the improvement on the next slide that the county did was to put in an accessible ramp to that bus shelter. The next improvement that is shown on the screen 
shows a, another bus stop that's placed in a median strip, and there's no landing pad in this case. And then the following slide shows that there's a landing pad and an accessible ramp that has been placed to um, the bus stop. And another item, another feature that was used very effectively throughout the county was you'll see this um, kind of, it's, it's like a little knee wall. It almost looks like a bench. And that's what it's being used at by for pedestrians that are using that as, as a bench to help um, you know, provide a, a safe and comfortable waiting area. That was another neat feature. And you'll see that the, the bench is made out of uh, stone so that it really deters people from putting graffiti on it. The next slide shows one of the issues that I wanted to describe in terms of the location, the problem with locating bus stops far away from pedestrian crossings. And the picture shows uh, an aerial photograph where there's a, a blue dot on both so either side of the roadway. And the blue dots are just the locations of bus stops. And those locations of bus stops, you can see there's no pedestrian crossing nearby. So the next slide shows that a, a crossing has been put in with a pedestrian median island so that pedestrians can get across. And the following slide illustrates a, a, a design plan of, of that and also a, a photograph of that final design in its, in its final state. And this is just another view of that, that crossing. And the real benefit of crossings such as this is it's not only used by people accessing transit, but it can be used by any pedestrian that needs to cross the roadway. So the keys to the success of this project were to, uh, one, use a field design. That is, to go out into the field, bring different um, uh, people with different disciplines out there to assess what the problem is and to come up with a solution. And that also ties into that second bullet, which is that team approach. Uh, another key to success is uh, combining projects that are identified for improving bus stops with other projects uh, on the roadways or, or doing projects uh, on a quarter-wide basis so that you're not just solving one problem at a time, but you're mobilizing a team to fix several bus stops on the roadway, uh, building attractive features so that pedestrians feel comfortable at the bus stops, and making tangible safety improvements in real time. So the next slide just shows is an introductory slide to the second um, case study that I want to talk about, which is the application of a pedestrian safety index in planning new rail stations. This slide just gives you a quick background to the project. And basically, um, the, the project is that, that um, there was a new Metrorail line for Washington, D.C. that is being planned to go from Washington, D.C. to Dulles International Airport in Loudoun County, Virginia. And basically, it's a 23-mile extension that will pass through two areas uh, that are of, have um, significant densities. One of them is Tyson's Corner, and the second one is Reston. And that's what I'm going to discuss is, is the access to the Reston station. And the arrow that shows on the screen right now, it's just a, a screen showing the region. And the arrow just really shows the distance that the new metro line needs to traverse. So the next slide shows an overview aerial image of the study area. What it shows is basically you have uh, the Dulles, uh, Dulles Access Road going kind of east-west to the middle of the screen. And you'll see that there's little red dots on, in the middle of the screen on either side of that roadway. And that's the location of the four stations in Reston. Two will be placed on Reston Parkway, and two will be placed on Wheeling Avenue. There's red circles around those stations, which represent a, a one-half mile catchment area around those stations for pedestrians. And then the yellow circles around the red circles represent a one-mile catchment area around the station. So that's basically the area that was looked at to conduct this study. The project objective was to develop a station management access plan to provide safe access, convenient access, and consider all modes. But really what I want to emphasize and concentrate on today is that pedestrian 
component, which included an inventory of all pedestrian facilities in that one-mile catchment area of each of the stations, and then how, we, how the uh, pedestrian interse intersection safety index was applied to help define where the problems were um, for pedestrians accessing these new stations. So the next slide just gives an uh, overview of the definition of a pedestrian intersection safety index. And basically, the pedestrian intersection safety index, the PISI, I'll call it, is a set of models that enables users to identify intersection crossings and intersection approach legs that should have the greatest priority for an in-depth safety assessment. The higher the index, the higher or the, the greater priority for a more in-depth ass assessment. And basically, the range for this assessment is 1 through 6. And I'll show you how that was applied in a few minutes. This slide shows um, basically the, um, what the, the model looks like, the PISI model. And the PISI is determined for, by calculating um, the crash potential for each approach and intersection. The data is readily available, as you can see in this table. And the data that is needed for that is signal control, whether it's a signalized crossing or not, stop control, whether it's stop or not, the number of through lanes that a, a, of the street that's being crossed, the speed. And it shows here in this table 85th percentile speed. But the documentation for using the model also says that you can use the posted speed limit. And that's what we used for this study. Uh, the main ADT, that is the main street average uh, daily traffic volume, and then if it's a commercial area or not. Those are the main uh, data fields that were collected. And these were very easily obtained in the field. The uh, traffic volume data, meaning the ADT, was obtained from the Virginia Department of Transportation. One of the issues with that is that on smaller uh, roadways, like residential streets, they typically don't collect that data for those streets, and so we didn't have that data. But that's not really where you would have your problems, as you can guess. You'd, we saw most of our problems in crossing your larger arterial roadways. So the next slide shows uh, a map of the entire catchment area for pedestrians, and it shows dots at each of the locations that were assessed using the PISI. Those dots that are in green had a value that was below the median, and those that are red and orange had um, a PISI that was above the median. The next slide shows a table of what some of, uh, of basically what the, the um, one of the other outputs of conducting the analysis using the PISI, and basically it shows that the PI, the PISI is determined for each approach of an intersection. So it doesn't give you an overall PISI for an intersection, but you get an assessment of each approach. For those approaches that were, or those intersections that were only three legs, there's information that would be missing because there weren't four approaches that were assessed. And what was determined from this analysis is that the for side streets, the PISI was about 1.5. And those are basically two-lane roads, low volume, with um, less than 2,000 vehicles per day and low speed. Your areas that were critical with a PISI of 5.5, approximately, were arterial streets with seven lanes, high traffic volumes of 30,000 vehicles per day, and speeds of 45 miles per hour. The next slide shows um, the PISI for two, the two main corridors on the, that, to access the um, two stations. You'll see what's, what's being circled now are the PISIs on Reston Parkway that are above four. And basically, the, the area that's being circled there is a segment of two, that's about 2,600 feet, which is about half a mile. So that shows that on Reston Parkway, there was a significant large area that was really difficult for pedestrians to cross. And so that's where our focus of a lot of the treatments were to improve pedestrian access to the stations that are coming in that will be built. The second thing that's being circled is um, on Wheelie Avenue, it shows a smaller section being circled where the PISI is above four, and that's about 500 feet. But again, that's not insignificant 
Um, and that's an area where uh, things where measures were taken to improve pedestrian access um, because that was seen, again, as a barrier for people to get across that, that roadway. So the application and prioritization, basically, uh, it, would be, it would have been difficult to highlight individual safety concerns on this vast area, this, this, two, this basically two-mile uh, catchment area for each of those, or one-mile catchment area for each of the stations, or two-mile catchment area in total, without using the PISI. The um, results were presented to residents, and that they, they saw that the safety concerns that they had were very similar to the results by the PSI, the PISI. And so the community trusts the analysis and using the PSI, PISI for um, um, further analysis throughout the study. One of the, some of the other benefits are that the um, 38 intersections were um, found to have detailed improvements. Uh, again, intersections were found, were determined for priority improvements, not just based on PISI, but you know, the proximity and the ability to access the new stations that are going to be built. And geometric changes were recommended for those 38 um, higher priority intersections, and general safety and visibility improvements were recommended for the remainder of the intersections. So the conclusions are that the PISI was successful um, in identifying uh, improvements that need to be made to access the two new metro stations that are being built in Reston. And it can also be used to identify corridors where there may be significant issues with pedestrians getting uh, from one side of the corridor to the other. And intersections with the high ISI values also corresponded to intersections which the community had concerns. Information of on uh, using the or the guide for the PISI is on the link on this slide. And finally, I'll just go over what we discussed on this next slide, and we discuss the resources that are available for improving pedestrian safety to the transit guide, how bus stops can be improved through the case study. I mentioned in Montgomery County, and then how we can use pedestrian ISI to identify locations with pedestrian safety issues, in particular to accessing in catchment areas to accessing uh, uh, rail transit. Uh, if there's any questions, you can uh, email me, and my email is dnabors at vhb.com. I would like to thank you for your attention, and at this time, I'd like to turn it over to back to Jeremy. OK, great. Thank you, Dan. Um, and just so that everyone knows, uh, we will be posting that transit guide to um, our webinars website, walkinginfo.org slash webinars. Um, and let me just pull up my, pull up my last slide here. Um, I want to thank Dan and, and Danny Rodriguez um, from the beginning of our program. And we have um, about 15 minutes for questions today. So um, just enter your questions into the box on the screen. Um, and if we run out of time for your question, we'll attempt to answer it and get back to you after the program. So, um, and right now, I'll begin with a couple of questions that we have. Uh, the first go way back to um, Dan, uh, to Dana Rodriguez's talk. Um, the question is, what are cold starts, and why will cold starts be less of an issue in the future? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, for uh, directing that uh, question. Um, well, to provide a little bit of background here, a lot of the transportation policy to date over the past uh, two decades, and maybe a decade and a half or so, has been really dominated by air quality issues. That partly explains the predominance of light rail investments, for example, relative to, to buses. And uh, most of the transportation investments are justified or, or evaluated um, predominantly based on air quality improvements. Yes, travel time matters, and, and for transit that is the case. Travel time improvements, economic development, and land use development potential. But air quality is, has been a driving factor. And in providing the context at the beginning of my presentation, I was trying to suggest that even though air quality is important and, and should be an important uh, criteria in evaluating 
uh, transportation improvements. In this case, access to transit and transit generally provides such benefits uh, to individuals, to families, and thus my, my focus on health and, uh, and other behaviors, that we shouldn't lose uh, sight of all these other benefits that uh, together would provide sort of a critical mass to bring change and to activate individuals that have a stake in this issue. Maybe not directly, but, but indirectly. So to go back to the question, uh, what, what is a cold start and why did I claim that it might matter less in the future? Uh, a cold start is a term uh, that denotes when a, when a motor vehicle, an engine, for example, for a car or a motorcycle or a bus, is turn on, turned on and it's cold. The, the catch here is that anywhere between 70 and 80 percent of all the emissions that happen in a vehicle uh, tend to happen in the very first few minutes when the engine is cold, when it's just started. So uh, what happens then is that the engine is running very rich in gasoline, not, love, not, not enough oxygen gets mixed in at the very beginning. Um, the catalytic converter is not quite uh, at the, its optimal working temperature. And so lots of those emissions happen at the beginning. Um, so decreasing cold starts is important and to the extent that folks that are walking or bicycling to transit are not driving or are not being driven to transit, uh, there's a benefit there in terms of air quality. Um, I do say that they're going to decrease for, for at least for a couple of reasons uh, in the future. One is that uh, new federal uh, uh, requirements and standards for vehicles are going to, are tightening uh, the performance and improving the performance of these um, converters and, and engines in general in terms of emissions. And so they are expected to decrease as, as the fleet gets renewed and the older vehicles retire or get scrapped and newer vehicles enter into the fleet. And I also expect that technological improvements, um, some related to new standards, some unrelated to new standards, that will also deal with this issue of, of cold starts. So in a nutshell, that, that's what it is. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, uh, next uh, couple of questions we have I'm going to direct toward uh, Dan Neighbors. Um, these ones go well together. Um, Dan, do you know how Maryland funded their bus stop improvements, and what are the total costs of improvements for Montgomery County bus stop case study? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Thanks, Jeremy, for directing that towards me. Uh, basically, they did an assessment to, to look at some of the problems and really uh, determine that a, fixing some of the bus stops might really go a long way towards improving uh, a lot of the issues that they're having. So they really got political support and political funding for this program. Basically, it was a, I think it was 45 years this program, and it was $11 million to improve the bus stops. But like I said, what they really did is they noticed that they had a, a problem throughout the county, and they thought by addressing a lot of the bus stop issues, since there was such high ridership, that that might be one way to help uh, address the pedestrian problem. So there was real political support behind that. Uh, they also have other mechanisms for improving pedestrian, pedestrian safety, or they do have some other funding uh, techniques. Um, some of them are creative, and one of them is they have a red light running program, which is helping fund pedestrian improvements also. So anybody that's, that's caught, um, oh, excuse me, I, I didn't mean red light running, a speed camera, uh, program. So anybody caught speeding to the speed camera program, um, the, the fines and the penalties assessed from that go to help improve pedestrian safety. So those are like two methods that help fund that program. Does that answer the question, Jeremy? Yeah. Um, actually, we, um, we have a, another sort of question that also gets to this um, that could be directed to uh, both of you. Um, the question uh, follows a little bit up on what you were just talking about. How have some of the improvements discussed in the two presentations been funded? Have federal funds been used? If so, how did that happen? And um, a last bit about that, how were MPO boards convinced that pedestrian access to transit was an important enough issue to take seriously and provide funding for? Um, maybe, Dan, if you want to keep talking about that. Okay. Uh, yeah, funding is, is something that is always a, a concern and uh, you know specifically talking about the Montgomery County project I think that covers a lot of what they were able to do in terms of finding uh, funding but uh, there's, there's other partnerships that uh, can be developed 
to really help uh, ensure that there's facilities that are being built, and some of that is partnerships through um, redevelopment of areas where um, you know the, the developer is responsible for not just improving their site, but any area that's, that would potentially be accessing the site. And that's something that's been very, very beneficial through partnerships, too. Some of the other funding mechanisms are if, if there is a documented crash problem, there's the H, the Highway Safety Improvement Program process, which has um, uh, will, will help funding problems. Uh, and with pedestrian issues, that typically can be effective because, unfortunately, when you do have pedestrian crashes, they tend to be severe. And uh, the, the more severe crashes will have a, a more a, a higher benefit cost ratio, if you will, for lack of a better word, so that um, they would fit into the Highway Safety Improvement Program funding. There's also a congestion mitigation and air quality uh, program, which a, a lot of these projects have been funded through. And, I, and that is actually, some of these, these funding resources are discussed in um, the guide. Now, the cost for doing improvements on an individual uh, intersection or an individual stop vary pretty greatly. Uh, if it's just putting in concrete pavement, you know that could be done fairly easily for uh, several thousand dollars. But you know, providing sidewalk up to a bus stop and things like that, it gets increasingly more ex expensive. And that's why with the Montgomery County program and other programs that we see throughout the country, they kind of prioritize those based off of uh, sometimes where they're seeing crashes but also where they're seeing the most activity, where there's the most potential for crash. So uh, there's a lot of mechanisms that can be used out there. And I don't know if we have enough time to get into all of them. But uh, again, one of the considerations, I think, is to weigh what the uh, potential for a crash is versus with what is the likelihood or ease that you can make an improvement. Um, does that? start to answer that question? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, now, uh, I guess I'll, I'll turn attention back to uh, Daniel. And we have a question about um, your research. What connectivity measures were used in your research? Um, yes, thank you, Jeremy. We've used a, a couple of different measures. And at that sort of aggregate level, we've looked at sort of traditional measures like uh, the, the number of three- and four-way intersections. Uh, just to get a sense of the, of the road connectivity. I, I believe for pedestrians, we really would like to move away from that. And uh, in the, the BRT study that I presented, for example, we use the audits, the, the street level uh, inventories, if you will, to examine the sidewalk, sidewalk connections. Uh, for each segment, we looked at whether the sidewalk, um, number one, was obstructed or interrupted. Uh, i.e. disconnected, and whether when you move to a different segment, because there was a, a street, for example, a street crossing, uh, whether it continued or whether it, whether it ended abruptly. So uh, from that perspective, we were looking at uh, connectivity at a very disaggregate level, and that's the measure that we used in, in that case, and I think it's, it's a measure that is more consistent with how pedestrians perceive the environment and how it influences their behavior. Uh, okay. Um, Daniel, sort of more about more about the um, uh, the BRT study. Um, I have a question here. How do you accommodate bike capacity issues on BOT on BRT or light rail vehicles? Wow, that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> um, my experience with BRT is that, um, as, as you might imagine, bus rapid transit is really a wide spectrum of potential uh, service types. Some that operate. Um, at an even higher level of service than most LRTs, more like a subway. Some that are closer to a regular bus system um, with, with some improvements. I think if you're closer to the bus side of, of BRT, if you will, the regular bus, um, you will see uh, front racks as being used uh, as, as the only way of adapting, I think, uh, bicycles, uh, bicycle on BRT. As you move away from buses and towards a much more high capacity mode, I don't know of any um, system that really operates uh, with bikes on BRT, partly because the front racks, um, when you have a high-capacity system with high frequency, are going to uh, introduce delays, passenger delays, in, in terms of the time the vehicle is stopped, 
that might really throw off a system that, that is sort of tightly operated. Um, having said that, Bogota in itself does have an active program of bicycle storage at stops. So rather than having you carry the bicycle on the vehicle, uh, it's similar to the CTA case study in, in, in many ways. Um, for more high capacity uh, transit uh, rail systems, um, you see CTA, you see BART and a few other systems allowing users to carry their bikes during the off-peak on certain trains, on certain cars, and that's, uh, that's more consistent with the general practice of those systems. BRT is kind of uncomfortable in the middle because it only has two to three cars and uh, making it a little harder to accommodate the bicycles on the vehicles. Well, um, uh, more to that point, Daniel, we have another question here. Um, what is the best way to park large number of bicycles um, to, uh, at these stops to accommodate them? Well, I, I haven't uh, studied per se how, how they're parked and what would be more efficient. Mm. But I, do, I mean, I know of several systems that are used that some are parked uh, standing up, uh, some, uh, and that seems to work quite well. Others have sort of two stories. Some use attendance, again, depending on, on uh, labor costs. Uh, some use parking attendance that help, uh, help work that out. Some are kind of uh, locker-ish cages, if you will. Uh, that provides a certain level of security. You might rent a lock or uh, so on. But it, it's going to depend on, on the particular case. I, I don't know exactly which one would be more efficient. I imagine that there, there are some, uh, some benefits to certain designs depending on the volume. Okay. Um, we have uh, time for taking a couple more questions here. I'm going to direct this one to Dan. Um, this is interesting. Um, are there any specific guidelines for making transit approaches and surfaces for children and youth? Is that um, something you can address? Um, making the approaches more accessible to children? Yes. Uh, there are, I don't know if there's specific guidelines, but there are some case studies that have showed um, some things that can be done. And a lot of that, of course, you, you can imagine would be around uh, the Safe Routes to School program. And a lot of them that are out there are more pertaining towards um, not uh, necessarily transit, but accessing bus stops. And, and the, bus, the issues that you see at bus stops are a little bit different than the issues that you see in transit, because the bus stops for um, you know, children going to school aren't done by a transit agency. That's usually a school district. So those can move around a lot. And, and uh, so it's a kind of a different set of problems uh, that are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's different things that are done in terms of providing uh, guidance on, on the pavement for uh, children, like stand-back lines of where they should be standing so that they're not, um, you know, standing in areas where they are more prone to getting injured by passing vehicles or buses, things like that. Um, uh, again, pavement marking areas that really emphasize paths that they should be taking to bus stops or signs things of that nature. It's kind of more information-based. And I don't know if there's like uh, any real-world studies that have really had um, uh, any, any definitive evaluation of that. Maybe Daniel might even know of something too, but those are the types of measures that are typically employed to really help children access bus stops, mostly signage and pavement marking. Uh, thank you. Um, maybe just one more question for Dan, um, real briefly here. Uh, were there any noted ridership impacts to the improvements in Montgomery County? Uh, well, that's, that's interesting, is that that is the focus of a uh, TCRP study right now. And just, I can tell you anecdotally, uh, in the sh short term, yes, that um, the one of the examples I gave you in terms of that, that mid-block crossing is that really captured a lot of trips where people were crossing um, almost anywhere in a, in a pretty wide segment of the roadway because there was no really defined crossing, is that that crossing really helped capture a lot of the pedestrian trips. And so there's much fewer mid-block crossings. Um, other transit improvements have shown uh, increased ridership because there's just increased awareness that uh, the, the transit stops are out there. But that's an interesting question, and it will be, like I said, the focus of a TCRP study that should be coming out next year. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you, Daniel. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for discussion today. We had a few more questions that we didn't get to, but um, if we didn't get to your question or you have additional questions, um, do not hesitate to contact me. Um, you can reach me at webinars at hsrc.unc.edu um, or call me at 919-843-4859. And before we end, I want to point out that many of the resources mentioned in this presentation will also be linked on our website at www.walkinginfo.org slash webinars. These resources include PDF copies of today's slideshow, uh, the transit guide mentioned in Dan's presentation, as well as several technical frequently asked questions regarding transit. Uh, also, you will be able to access a recording and transcript of this presentation from that same web page Today's presentation should be made available on this page in about a week. Um, you'll also be able to register for the next webinar, scheduled for Thursday, November 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, when Peter Lagerway of Tool Design Group will present The Power of 25 Advocacy Strategies for Creating Livable Communities. And again, for the archive material and to register for future webinars, please visit www.walkinginfo.org slash webinars. I'd like to thank our speakers today, Danny Rodriguez and Dan Abers, and thanks to all of you for attending the first PBIC Livable Communities webinar. Um, thank you, and have a good day. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, Daniel.